right. Um, welcome to CS4510, Lecture 17A. Um, today's topic is going to be entirely on uh, space complexity. The first half, we're going to prove a relationship uh, between non-determinism and space complexity. And the second half, we're going to talk about p-space completeness. Uh, the first half is going to be just sort of some high-level ideas about space itself. And then we're going to prove uh, Savage's theorem. Last time we talked about uh, the Cook-Levin theorem. And actually, Savage was a student of Cook, like immediately after uh, or before the Cook-Levin theorem. I don't remember. But it's a very important theorem, and it's, 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 it's kind of a beautiful result. You know, a lot of times, when you want to show something, the only way you have to do it is an algorithm. Um, so Savage's theorem really is an, algor an algorithm to relate uh, complexity classes. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. First, we need to talk about space complexity itself. So space, in terms of um, time, relate, with, as it relates to time, is a very, very, very different resource. It's, it's much uh, funnier, I think. So time, like in like a physical intuitive sense, you can always return to a position in space that you were previously, and, but you can never return to a position in time. In sort of a more algorithmic analogy, like you, whenever you run an algorithm, you can never ever get the time back, but you can always get the space back. Um, you can reuse the space essentially, but you cannot reuse the time. Uh, this is what makes it very, very different. Um, and there's two immediate uh, reasons this makes it different. Uh, first, I mentioned previously like why p versus n p is such a hard and insane problem. You know, it's you know all these people have try or have tried to solve it and failed. All these techniques have been developed, tried to solve it and failed. Um, and p versus n p is a question about polynomial time uh, and its relationship with non-determinism. But space is a subfield of uh, complexity theory, which we're basically know what most of the questions do. We have had a lot of success actually answering a lot of the uh, theorems about space complexity. Um, we'll talk about some of those today. But there was problems that stood for a long time, uh, and then they were resolved. People just came up with solutions to them. So it's not as interesting in that regard. A second reason it's not as interesting, uh, or perhaps more interesting, is that it's, uh, so when you study time complexity, you're concerned with reducing the number of computation steps that an algorithm takes to perform some action. Um, but when you study space complexity in a way that's independent of time, it allows you to do some arcane and impractical, impractical things that do not apply to the theory of algorithms. For example, you may be able to perform exponential, insane, crazy search in order to reduce the space complexity by one bit. So sometimes the smallest space complexity algorithm is not the best algorithm, so to speak. And in fact, the most common, you, you might... Occur, uh, um, Witness this firsthand if in um, dynamic programming, where you have an exponential time algorithm with a constant space, but then you trade it for a polynomial space algorithm with polynomial time. So you perform a trade-off there, and the time is a much more valuable resource than space, um, so you, you get it back. In general, time is, is, is very expensive. We don't have much of it, but space is cheap. And I, and I mean also, like, there's plenty of it, but also in a literal sense, because hard drives are cheap, you know. SSDs are, like, really cheap now for some reason. Like, what I paid, like... $200 for like 18 months ago, it's now like $40. So uh, you want more space, um, there's, there's really plenty of it. Uh, and, right. Um, so let's remark on some really elementary um, first ideas about space. Uh, the first thing is that the, the input doesn't count towards space. So the input doesn't count. Otherwise, every algorithm would be linear space. Um, the, what, what, the way we model this is, in fact, uh, n we have a separate tape uh, for the input, and it's kind of a bounded finite tape. So we have some sort of program control here, like a Turing machine, and it reads the input off what's called the input tape, and then it has a normal unbounded tape, which is called the work tape. So this is the input tape, and this is the work tape. Of course, there's a translation here between machines which may compute and machines which may decide. Uh, 
So in the scenario where this is a, uh, uh, some sort of space-bounded machine, which is asked to, dis to compute instead of decide, there'd be even, maybe even a third tape, which counts the input, excuse me, which, which you would write the output on. Um, did you get any cookies? Go get some cookies. So, <laughs> so they're not going to be here after the break. Um, right. Uh, right, so we don't count the input as part of the space. Uh, this is where the input would go. And it's like a finite bounded control. We can assume it doesn't read off it or anything. And then the work tape is where it actually the machine has to do its kind of scratch. And that's really what we're interested in, is the, is the amount of additional, quote unquote, scratch or work tape, work tape required uh, in order to perform. Whatever it reads off the input is, is just that. You know, um, space is really essential, is an extremely essential part of computation, even though it's not discussed as much. Like, what is really the difference between a weak, pathetic DFA and the ultimate superior Turing machine? It's just, you just gave it a memory access, just a bit of memory control. So space, uh, very weird, very different um, uh, for these reasons. Uh, but that's not to say it's like totally independent uh, of its relationship with time. Like, um, so basically, anytime you want to use a unit, uh, a, a unit of space, and first, let me define this class. We'll define space of f of n to be the class of languages uh, decidable by a machine, so a deterministic uh, two-tape Turing machine with one tape is bounded like this, decided by, by a machine which uses an uh, f of n space on an input of size n. Uh, the other thing is, as a quick an, a final aside on, on how weird space is, so you can have a, if you have an unbounded looping Turing machine, you can have such a machine use infinite space as it does use infinite time. Maybe you have a Turing machine that writes infinitely uh, symbols on its tape and doesn't halt. But like kind of orthogonally, you could have a space bounded Turing machine which does loop infinitely. We don't consider the space complexity of looping programs at all. All the programs we consider the ones which halt. So if, if a machine loops on some input, it's, un, we don't, it's undefined on what the space complexity is, even if it does use finitely many symbols. Um, now, if you want to use a new unit of space, uh, let's say you want to write a symbol here, you are required, in order to use a unit of space, you are required to use one unit of time. It costs time in order to move through space. So in, we get an immediate corollary of that, is that if a machine runs in uh, time f of n, the most space it can use is bounded, not, like, not even by O of f of n, but exactly f of n, right? If you, you, if you take t steps, you cannot use more uh, than t cells of the tape. And that's sort of maximally assuming that each step writes to a new cell. Often the times, like in an algorithm, most of the time, you're not going to be writing to a new cell. But uh, in the worst case, you are, right? So we can determine the relationship between these two classes immediately. Right. We can actually uh, perform a sort of uh, a similar idea for the other thing. If you have a space bounded machine, there is a there is a bound on the number of steps that the machine can take. So, like, uh, suppose you have a machine. Suppose uh, uh, M runs in space of, uh, let's say, like uh, O of, uh, well, let's just say straight up S of n. So we have somehow a space bound on a machine. So this machine we know runs in space at most f of n. Then I claim uh, then m uh, runs in time at most, uh, like a 2 to the O of s of n. Right. So if, it, if a machine uses so much space, it turns out that it can't, it has to use uh, only so much time. You can only go a certain number of steps before you're forced to use more space again, basically. The idea is kind of a pigeonhole principle kind of thing. So like, what is a computation if not a, like a sequence of configuration? So like, let's say M has a sequence of configuration C0 to C1 to C2 to C3 
uh, whatever, and then eventually it halts after like t steps. Okay, so uh, a computation is a sequence of configurations, of course. And if m runs in t steps, then there are t plus one configurations, right, counting the initial one. Um, what if if but if the machine um, has space bound s of n? We also know that the size of a configuration is going to be O of S of N, right? A configuration, recall, is like a string that represents uh, the encoding of the machine. Most of the, most of the encoding of the machine is going to be the tape. It also contains information for the position of the head and the current state it's at. So the size of a configuration is about like, it's approximately, I'll just say O of, o of S of N, right? So the size of a configuration is approximately the space bound of the machine used, like in the worst case. Um, if it doesn't use more than S of n cells, then the configuration can't be longer than S of n. Right? Now, how many possible configurations of the machine are there? I'm not call talking only about the valid ones, which are reachable or something, but how many possible configurations are there, just in general? It's a really a combinatorics thing. Like, How many strings of length S of n are there? Uh, it's going to be... Uh, 2 to the O of S of N possible configurations. Why? Well, consider a configuration as a string, and suppose we were trying to do some uh, arithmetic on how many possible strings are there valid in Turing machines of codings, right? Each character, if there's N, if, if the configuration is length N or S of N, um, at each one, you can choose a symbol from either Q or gamma, right? And you can only choose the Q from it one time, but the rest of them are gamma. So it's kind of like gamma uh, to, to the n, right? We're going to call it 2 to the O of S of n, and, and it's still exponential, and that, and that transformation works, right? So we can agree there's 2 to the O of S of n possible configurations. Now, suppose, to the contrary, that the machine which runs in t steps uses more uses more than the possible number of configurations, right? So let's say it exhausts every possible configuration, uh, but it can continue. So let's say there exists some i um, such that c i uh, goes to something, and then after a certain number of steps, it has to go back to that something again, right? So if it uses more than the possible number of configurations, in the sequence, which is its computation, there exists a repetition. That's what that means. Um, but what do we know is true if this is the behavior of the machine? So what the behavior of the machine is, I'm saying, is it has, is at some, some configuration at some point, and it reaches that configuration again at a different point in time. Oops. Yeah. If you, if you're, it's a deterministic Turing machine. So whatever reaches the state, it's going to reach the state again. It has entered, it is, it, the next state can only be the one that came here, right? So it's going to enter a loop. We're not, we don't care about the machines that loop, and we, this is a deterministic halting Turing machine. So the machine halts. So contradiction, can't loop. So there, we can conclude then that, the, that T is uh, less than equal to uh, 2 to the O of S of N. Right? So we, given the space bound, we can actually give ourselves a time bound on the machine. That's what that says. So there is, it's a, the relationship between space and time is... Uh, uh, not totally alien or independent. They're, they're sort of related to each other just by, just by the fact that one must use the other. Um, right. So as a final interesting thing about like why space is weird, I'm going to give some uh, evidence about why we use big O notation. So we introduced big O notation in algorithms, right? And we don't care about it just because we care about the leading term of a statement. We actually use big O notation because um, the parts of the algorithm that we care about, uh, our, the big O only shows us the part which we can't change. But the parts that we can change, we can change due to an automata and complexity level uh, uh, finesse, sort of, so to speak. So what I'm going to prove is that space, this is called like a, a, a speed up theorem, that anything that is solvable in space f of x is actually also solvable 
in space uh, the max of 1 and s of n minus c for all constant c. So if the machine uses uh, s of n space, we can actually prevent it from using 10 cells or something like this, right? Uh, right. So we can, and this is also a reason why when we write constants, we don't write like O of 3, right? We rather write O of 1. So if n is a constant, if n is a, excuse me, if the machine is a space, is a constant space machine, we can actually build an equivalent machine which uses no space, or maybe one cell of space. If uh, the machine is quadratic, or uses quadratic space, we can build a machine that only has constantly less space, which is still, right, so like O of uh, n squared minus 10 is still equal to O of n squared, right? We don't really, that's, this is sort of, we're gonna, by proving this, we're gonna kind of prove, for at least for space complexity, and there are analogous things for multiplicative constants for time complexity, and multiplicative constants for uh, space complexity and the multiplicative constants, excuse me, the additive constants for time complexity, uh, that we don't really care about them. We can do, we, we, we were taught that we say we don't care about them, but you, by this, by proving this, we're going to be able to prove that, um, like, provably, we don't care, right? We can speed up by a constant amount always. Uh, so let, um, let uh, M be a machine with a space bound of S of n, uh, give m prime to use space uh, S of n minus one, right? So if we can create an equivalent machine which uses just one less unit of space, we can inductively or recursively apply, uh, apply that to get C. So this is sufficient to prove that theorem. What are the, do you guys have any ideas about how we might create, given a program, can we write an additional program which uses one less uh, piece of space? I think, or like I'm struggling to come up with like, or I'm trying to like think of an application. Like if you're sorting and you have a sorting algorithm and you run up against the limits of like you, if it's a no event sorting algorithm, how can you take away one less like entry in the array? It seems like that's kind of necessary. So we wouldn't, so we wouldn't count uh, the O of n. So it depends. Like the O of n space of a sorting algorithm comes, it actually counts that input. It doesn't count the additional work tape, right, in this, in this picture, right? So the elements of the, the n elements would be on the input. Mm -hmm. And then we wouldn't count them. We would only count the additional work, you know, which would be including sizes of stack frames and, and so on. So that, in some sense, is a, in the more, more formal way, is a constant space algorithm already. But I claim we can reduce the constants to zero. It seems like with that, like especially with sorting, like you need like a, usually a temp variable in order to like move one, swap it over. Mm -hmm. You do that with no temp variable, or like how do you do that with zero space? So the temp, well, it depends on the the exact formulation of the sorting. If I recall, we can we don't you could consider the sizes of the elements that are being sorted. Well, we usually consider the number of the elements, just to make it easier, because then you have a complexity in terms of multiple variables and it looks messy. But we consider the sizes of the elements to be constant. So the tenth variable would be constant size. Right? So I claim you can do, and this is not easy to see, to see. and actually this is not, this is a great example of a theorem which is not really applicable to algorithms. Um, because it doesn't, I don't think this works in the von Neumann model of computation, which, if I recall, means that the program control is stored on the tape as well, right? Might be misremembering something about that. But the Turing machine description is independent of the space it uses. But in an actual, like the von Neumann style computer, the code of the program is stored on the tape as well. So in the realist measure of complexity, you, of space complexity, like as most practical as possible, you have to count the size of the program, okay? and there is maybe a Kolmogorov kind of thing we could talk about that with, but it, it, specific, it specifically makes this theorem not apply to like real uh, complex, real measurable com algorithmic complexity when it does apply to the classes we've defined it. Um, the reason I mention that is because here's, here's basically the answer. Uh, 
is like, let's suppose M looks like this. Uh, and it uses the tape in this way. All right, we want to eliminate one cell of usage. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to duplicate the size of the program. Let's see this starts. It's just some general graph. So we copy, make a, we make a copy of the entire code. We duplicate the entire code, and we uh, keep track of the single cell in these states, so to speak. So whenever we want to read or write to this first cell, what we're going to do is actually transition between the two copies of the machine we made. Like if we read or write here, we're going to move to this machine and then continue the uh, simulation of M. And then, if we, and then if we were here and we needed to read or write to that single cell, we could maybe move to the first copy. Right. So we've doubled the size of the program, but we've now used one less unit of space. So if we were to repeat this C times to get C, we would have a program of size 2 to the C. Right. So you have an exponentially sized program, but now a finite, constantly less space. Not that good. Another way to think of this is like if you, you in, a, in a, sometimes you don't count the registers as space because there's only finitely many registers and each only holds a finite amount of size, and then you count the RAM as the space, in some sense. So in, what this really proves is really like if you added one additional register to hold one additional word, uh, it doesn't change anything. Right. Any questions on this uh, theorem? I think, it really, I think the questions especially really display why space is, is such a weird resource, much, a very different resource. This is called the speed-up theorem. There are analogous and harder ones you can do for like the multiplicative constants and the additive constants and so on. Like if you wanted to prove like, I don't know, like O of 2 to the n is like O of n for space or time, what you can do is just change uh, uh, the alphabet to be something squared. Like you can speed up or slow down that way by changing the way the program is interpreted. And, and again, in a way that doesn't really affect the computation of the real machines, you know. It's totally, totally theoretical. All right, so let, now let's go on to the main point of today's theorem, which is Savage's theorem. Fun fact, we call this Savage's theorem, but he got the idea uh, from a paper by Hopcroft and someone else. I don't remember exactly. But they proved a similar related thing uh, only about context-free languages. And Savage saw the result and basically was able to tell, like, this is, applies to a much, much more general problem than uh, context-free languages. And so we call it Savage's theorem. It really elucidates the relationship between uh, non-determinism and space, basically. So, like, um, if you have n space, uh, if you have a non-deterministic space-bounded machine which uses f of n space, he gives a way for you to deterministically simulate the machine uh, with uh, a certain overhead. So, you can deterministically simulate uh, the non-deterministic space-bounded machine using not f of n space, but f squared of n space. This is really the statement of Savage's theorem. If you have a non-deterministic space-bounded machine using only f of n space, you have a way to deterministically simulate the space using only f squared of n space. So it doesn't say anything about time, but using only quadratically more space, you can perform a deterministic simulation of a non-deterministic machine. So two immediate remarks about this. First off, that's something. That's only squared of something. Square of something is only polynomially much more, right? So if we define uh, p space, and we did previously, but if we define p space to be uh, k equals zero to infinity of uh, 
space uh, n to the k, and we define uh, np space is equal to uh, k equals zero to infinity of n space, and we didn't define n space, but it's defined analogously to space, right? N to the k. Then Savage's theorem tells us an immediate relationship between these two classes. And notice that these classes really are analogs of P and NP, but for space, where P is poly deterministic polynomial time, NP is non-deterministic polynomial time, P space is deterministic polynomial space, NP space is deterministic polynomial space, by the fact that every N space algorithm has a P space, has a deterministic space algorithm uh, with only quadratic more overhead, the square of a polynomial is a polynomial. So what we can conclude from this immediately is that uh, NP space is equal to P space. So we know the relationship between polynomial space and non-deterministic polynomial space by the result of this theorem. That's really the, the heart of Savage's theorem. It shows that non-determinism really doesn't say anything about polynomial space. Um, two reasons this is significant. One, we can prove it. We can't prove P versus NP, but we can prove NP space equals P space. Right? We have no idea still how to prove a P versus NP. We have no idea how to do something analogous for time. And two, um, it's in the negative of what we would, we would expect. We think like P does not equal NP. We think that really, really hard. But we are able to prove the opposite for space. We can prove that non-determinism doesn't give you a speed up for space. It gives you only a polynomial speed up for space, but it appears to give you like an exponential speed up for time. It doesn't appear to give you a polynomial speed up, a, a, a exponential speed up for space. Um, another thing is, is, um, is just by the result, we can kind of infer what the proof is going to look like just by looking at the result. So every time you see a problem, you should think, or maybe it's unhealthy to think, but you should think, how can this apply to P versus NP, right? Um, so here we have, at its core, a de non determinizifying technique. We haven't even talked about the proof yet, but we have what the result is. Somehow, just by the result, we have a non deterministic machine, and we're able to simulate it deterministically with only a quadratic speed up in the resource used. That is awesome. But it's the wrong resource. It's not the resource we care about. We care about time. If we can do it for space, uh, can the technique apply to time? So Somehow, we don't know what the technique is yet. We're about to do the proof. But somehow, there's a deterministic speed up. With a determinant, you can, quote unquote, like a D non determinizify. You can, you can D non determinizify it with only this quadratic speed up into the resource. Um, can, the, can the technique work for P versus NP? Here, here's the sort of archaeological answer, no, because someone would have found it already. So we can determine that although there's only a polynomial speed up, a polynomial increase in the space, there should not be a polynomial increase in the time. So we can just infer, just from the result, that it, since if, if it did apply to P versus NP, someone would have figured it out by now. Because they haven't, then there isn't a polynomial speed up in time with just a result. From that, we can infer there is an exponential or at least super polynomial speed up with respect to time. So somehow, although this is a quadratic speed up with respect to space, it should invoke an exponential speed up with, return, with respect to time. Does that make sense? This is an intuition building exercise. It's totally made up and everything, but like, how do you, just to, just to be able to infer, because this is still an open problem, we, we should be able to infer that the simulation takes exponential time and therefore can't apply to P versus NP. It turns out that's correct. But maybe you should be able to develop an intuition about why that's true just from the result. Right. So we can, right. Any questions on the statement of the theorem before we go on to the proof? So the reason uh, Savage's theorem is so important is because it really borrows uh, a lot from the idea of algorithms. What we're going to do is essentially uh, do a div conquer algorithm. We're going to do divide and conquer. So basically, like if n is a machine, n accepts w if there is exists a sequence of configurations uh, from C0 
to some CA. So C0 is a start configuration. CA is an accepting configuration. You can consider, given C0 and CA, if there exists a way to go from C0 to CA, right? In, let's say, some T steps. Uh, if we can determine if C0 goes to CA in T steps, then we can determine if N accepts W in T steps, essentially, right? Um, but what we can do is the div conquer idea is we can just uh, split this in half. So if C0 can go to some C, so like there exists some C, such that C0 can go to C in T over two steps, and then C can go to CA, which is C except in T over two steps, then this, these two are equivalent, right? If we can go to C0 to CA in T steps, that's the same as going from C0 to C in T over 2 and C to CA in T over 2 steps, right? So that's basically the idea we want to check. And the machine being space-bounded means that um, we also have a time bound there. So we can just choose the appropriate T for the space-bounded machine, and we can determine that it uh, N accepts W within the space bound. We have a deterministic simulator uh, that does the same. The reason that div conquer is so essential here is the same reason that time is more important. Is space is more useful than time. Well, no. Space, so space can be reused. So when you make recursive calls, you can, can finish the call stack and then just keep a bit of the answer. Time cannot be reused, but the space can. So when you perform these many recursive calls that you know by the master theorem or something might be terrible and, and really not good, if you perform the recursive calls sequentially instead of like in parallel or something, the space doesn't increase because you've overlapped the space, so to speak. It, it gets to be reused. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to call, we're going to define this function can yield. And our immediate function header is going to be can yield C0, CA, and uh, we want to determine if the space-bounded machine N, non-deterministic space-bound machine, which uses F of N space, uh, halts, accepts W within that space-bound. So if it accepts it within that space-bound, we know that it uses 2 to the O of F of N time, in the worst case. Otherwise, it loops, right? So we can determine, we can insert here uh, 2 to the D of F of N. Right. So we want C0, we can yield will return true if C0 can be, if there is a sequence according to the transition function of M, uh, of N, that goes from C0 to CA in 2 to the D of F of N steps. Um, what is D? Well, D, we're going to write here, choose a big enough D, basically. How would you do that? Well, you could run it in a for loop until it returns correctly, right? It's a O of f of n, so you just have to put the constant there, and you just choose the next biggest one, right? Two, three, four, and so on. Uh, now we want to define, if, so this function will return true if C0 is reach, if, C, if you can, after uh, two to the d of f of n steps, you can go from C0 to CA, and that's true if n accepts w in space bound f of n. So now we need to define a general procedure uh, to compute can yield, right? So I'm going to put here can yield of C i C j uh, t, and this function is going to return uh, the, the more general problem. We want to determine if C zero if if C i can be reached uh, to C j in t steps based on some fixed machine, right? So, of course, every divide and conquer algorithm needs a base case, right? So, uh, if a t equals 1, uh, then we can say if ci equals cj, except. So, ci, cj, again, are configurations of the machine. If it's the same configuration, then that's our base case, right? Uh, we also could say if a ci yields cj, uh, after one step of uh, delta of n, and of course is a space-bound machine using f of n space, uh, 
If CI and CJ are adjacent configurations, so after one step of the transition function of n, we know CI goes to CJ, then we can also accept. So because that would return can yield of CI, CJ, one, right? So we'd also accept. And we could say, uh, else, uh, the more general recursive case, T is greater than one. Now we want to do is do what we did here, where we kind of get, we, I don't want to say guess, but we find C, which is the midpoint, and then we uh, break it up into two halves. So we make two calls to can yield from itself from this, and then we determine if, uh, to determine if CI is reachable to CJ, we put this middle thing here, which we'll talk about how we find it in a second, and then we determine if we can go from the first to the middle, and then the middle to the end. And if that's true, then the whole thing has to be true, obviously. Now the way I've written this is uh, for uh, C in configurations of N using F of N space. So basically, this for loop is going to brute force search over exponentially many configurations. It's just going to try all the configurations. This is the step that uses exponential time. Okay? We're doing an ex this, but it doesn't matter about the time complexity of this program. We're concerned with reusing the space. So we're going to just keep trying every possible configuration C. Non-deterministically, we could have just guessed C. But here we're going to brute force search for C. And there's going to be one correct. And if there is one correct, our program is going to find it and return correct. Might take a while, but that doesn't matter. We don't care about the time. We care about the space. So we're going to we're going to do a for loop over this exponential thing, and then we're going to say um, if uh, I'm going to do can yield as an as a as a thing here because I'm running out of space. Can yield um, c i c uh, uh, t over two and can yield c c j t over 2, except. Now, if we haven't done anything at that point, we have no choice but to reject. Okay, This is really the heart of the, of Savage's theorem, is the display of this algorithm. Any questions on this? This is not a, uh, uh, before we get into the space, the correctness about why it uses this much space, is there any questions about what this algorithm is doing, what we're, what we're doing? We're, so we're performing a deterministic simulation of a non-deterministic machine. And we use this div conquer idea in order to do it. Basically, uh, like here, if we can go from C0 to CA in T steps, then we just put, we, we exponential, use exponential time to find the correct C so that we can go from C0 to C in T steps, T over two steps, and then C to CA in T steps. So here, we just try every single C to see if we can go from CI to C in T over 2 and C to CJ in T over 2. Because CI and CJ are whatever the generic names of the, of the function header are, are. If these both return true, then we know we can go from uh, the first to the mid in T over 2 and then the mid to the end in T over 2. So we know then that we can go from CI to CJ in T, if that's true. Here's the important part, though, for a recursion call. These recursion calls are expensive in terms of time. Space, they're not. Why? You perform them sequentially. You perform this whole recursion call. Then you perform this whole recursion call in the same space. This does all the stack frame stuff. All this, it's going to make all the calls to itself because it's going to enter back in here and whatever. But it's fine because when it returns, it's going to use one bit. One bit is going to be left on the table of the answer, if it was true or false. This is going to use the same space. So the space gets to be reused in that respect. right? So now we need to measure the space complexity. This is clearly a, a correct determine any any doubts that this is a correct deterministic simulator of the non-deterministic machine which uses f of n space, right? Now we need to measure the space of this uh, of this program. This simulates the non-deterministic machine, and this is clearly a deterministic algorithm. We need to measure the space of it. Uh, when we measure the space, it's going to be there's going to be all these stack frames called made for rec recursively. So the space used is going to be uh, equal to uh, the size of a stack frame times the recursion depth. Is that clear? When we make a recursive call, we keep the stack frame there, and then we enter a new 
uh, call to that. And the most space we can use is going to be the recursion depth plus is going to be the recursion depth, and for each recursion depth is going to be the size of the maximum stack frame. So at most you're going to have the depth of recursions, stack frames, and then each stack frame is going to have its size. So it's going to be the size of the stack frame times the recursion depth. Okay? What is the size of the stack frame? That is the recursion depth. Right, let's do that one first then. The, re the recursion depth, at each step we take t and we divide it by 2, right? So you can only divide it by 2 log t many times. So the recursion depth is going to be log t. And we'll figure out what that is in a second. What is the size of a stack frame? Constant time. Sorry? Constant time? Or like constant space? No. <laughs> but, uh, so what goes into a stack frame? And I don't remember this stuff from 2110, but like, it's going to be the arguments, basically, right? Um, and like some constant pointers and so on. But it's going to at least going to contain the arguments. But won't that be the same amount every time? Or like same sized arguments every time? Correct. But what is that size? Oh. It's going to be the size of a configuration, at least. It's going to be the two times the size, two configurations plus the size of t. So what is the size of a configuration? Um. F of n, right? It uses f of n space. The size of the configuration has to be f of n. There's a good, let's say t is even f of n, maybe. Um, so f of n, f of n, f of n. We can just call that the size of the stack frame is going to be O of f of n, right? Each stack frame is going to be approximately constantly more than the size of a configuration, right? Because that's the total space the machine can use. The recursion depth is log t. But, law, but t is what? t at our initial function call is 2 to the d of f of n. Right, this is the entrance call. That's the general divide and conquer algorithm. The entrance call is going to be 2 to the d of f of n. Uh, d of f of n is going to be 2 to the d, log of 2 to the d of f of n is going to be what? what? So we can say that's O of f of n times log of. 2 to the d of f of n. And what is this? d of f of n. Yes, but then I'm going to ignore the d and say that's just o of f of n times f of n. o of f of oh, n. Right. That gives us o of f of n squared. Any questions on this, on this algorithm? Truly a beautiful result. A lot of old people like this theorem. Uh, if you talk to them, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's divide and conquer is a, you know, it's, it's a, one of the many tools used in algorithms. But here, we're using it to show a simulation totally beyond actual implementations, right? And we use it to abuse this space reuse thing. Um, but you would never be able to run this, of course, because it takes exponential time. And you would never be able to, uh, a non-deterministic computer, first of all, made up. It's not real. It's got magic power. You would never have one, and then you would never ever try to simulate it deterministically for exponential cost. However, the technique still applies in this uh, unfathomable computation resource in order to prove a uh, very important theorem. And we already talked about the implications of the theorem that np space equals p space during, the, during this uh, de non deterministifying technique. Any questions on this? All right, uh, coming back from the break, we'll talk about uh, P-space completeness.